Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma ba'da habta fillah Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Continuing on in our study of Baluga Maram The Book of Marriage, Kitab al-Nikah uh, we reach the 953rd hadith narrated Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, daughter of Qais. I said, O Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, my husband has divorced me by three pronouncements of divorce, and I am afraid that I may get broken into, meaning her home would be burglarized or she felt threatened. Hence he commanded her and she moved to another house reported by Muslim. In this hadith <coughs> of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the hadith of Fatima bin Qais radiallahu ta'ala anha, she came to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, out of fear and she mentioned to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that her husband had made three pronouncements of talaq or three pronouncements of divorce uh, upon her meaning this this was talaq al-ba'in this was the irrevocable divorce meaning that they are no longer lawful for one another uh, that she finishes her idda, and then she uh, would remarry if she chooses to do so, but she cannot return to her husband. Because as she mentioned, that it was the third divorce, that he had divorced her, three pronouncements. And she came to the Prophet and she was fearful of being alone, of being in the home, in her husband's home, by herself, because... Perhaps it was the custom or at least in this situation where she was going to be alone in the home <clears throat> and uh, during her idda. So she was fearful of being away, uh, being by herself and being without her family or anyone to look after her. So she asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about this situation and he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam commanded her to uh, move from that uh, lo location. And this hadith is in Sahih Muslim. <clears throat> uh, in this hadith, this hadith shows us that, of course, as we mentioned prior to this, that the idda is in the home of the husband. That while a woman is in her idda, her waiting period after divorce, <clears throat> that she spends that time in her husband's home. And some of the hikmah that when it's irrevocable is that perhaps they will uh, reconcile, that they will come back together. And this is the general ruling. Uh, from this hadith, we see that at times there can be exceptions, and this is what the Prophet وسلم, ordered Fatima bin Qais to take that exception due to her fear. So one of the benefits we gain from this hadith is that this hadith shows us that during all time periods, evil would exist. Evil would exist during all time periods. And this was during the time of the Sahaba and the time of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, that there of course was evil. That there was, uh, that she was a Sahabiya and she was fearful that someone would, would uh, break into her home and perhaps cause her harm. So this uh, illustrates for us that even during the best of, the time of the best generations, which was the Sahaba and the Tabi'een with Tabi'een, that evil existed and um, 
will always continue to exist. So it existed then in those best times because the Prophet said, the Prophet ﷺ said, the best people is those of my generation, then those who follow them, then those who follow them. So this shows us the importance of the uh, the first three generations in Islam and that they make up the Salaf as <coughs> They make up the pious predecessors. And so even during their time period, evil existed. And this hadith is uh, illustrates for us because Fatima bin Qais went to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and asked for his permission, you know, uh, and 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 shared with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam her situation that she was in fear uh, that someone would break into her home. Uh, another benefit of this hadith, it illustrates for us that it is a necessity that people look out for their well-being and that they strive to be away from evil. So they should protect themselves and their interests, their persons, and do whatever is necessary that's mubah or that's lawful uh, to be away from shah, to be away from evil. And this is uh, why the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave her permission to leave her husband's home and protect herself uh, from, from that harm. In the next hadith, narrated Amr ibn As radiallahu ta'ala anhu, do not confuse us about our Prophet's Sunnah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The period that a slave woman whose master dies and she has begotten a child for him must wait uh, must wait for is four months and ten days. Reported by Ahmed Abu Dawood Ibn Majah, Al Hakam graded it as authentic uh, Sahih. But a Darqutni considered it defective due to inkita, meaning a broken link in the chain of narrators. <clears throat> As was the duration of the Iddah uh, in regards to uh, Umu Wal Walid, meaning the mother of the uh, uh, a slave woman who has already mothered a child for her master. Uh, if she is widowed, some scholars are of the opinion that it is four months and ten days, where some of them maintain that it is one menstrual period only. Uh, and so this shows the differences that the scholars have with regards to this, uh, to this hadith. And so... Uh, this hadith, the, the scholars also differ over the authenticity over this hadith. Uh, and the general ruling is uh, that obtained from this hadith uh, mentions the, uh, the idda, the idda. Uh, in regards to a slave woman who has already mothered a child for her master. In the next hadith, narrated Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, Al-Aqra is the period of a woman's purity which occurs between two menses. Uh, Malik, Ahmed, and Nisa'i reported it in the course of a story with a Sahih uh, authentic chain of narrators. This hadith, uh, the topic of this hadith is it refers to the waiting period uh, or the, the term al iqra which refers to, uh, there are two varying opinions with regards to the meaning of this uh, of this statement, that this period, that it is either uh, refers to the the tuhr or the purification, uh, 
that this is how we count the idda, or that uh, it is the height or the, uh, the the menstruation of a woman. So some of the scholars mention that al quru that's mentioned in the ayah, which is the plural form of the al aqra as is mentioned in Surah Al Baqarah. وَالْمُطَلِقَاتُ تَرَبَّسْنَا بِأَنفُسِهِنَّ ثَلَاثَةَ قُرُوءٍ uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that the mutalaqat, uh, the, woman, the women who have been divorced, <coughs> that they uh, keep to themselves, meaning that they're talking about their waiting period, for three قُرُوءٍ uh, قُرُوءٍ And so the scholars, they mention uh, al-qurūu or al-qara, uh, al this is referring to al-aqra, which we were talking about. This this uh, is the plural form of that uh, of the the same word. And with regards to that, the scholars they differ. Some of them they count the the thalatha quru uh, as haid, that it is menstruation. So with that, then thalatha quru refers to thalatha menstru menstruation uh, menstrual cycles. And the other group of scholars mention that uh, and define the quru as a tuhr or purification, and so they refer to it as thalatha uh, as three uh, uh, purifications that the woman has finished her menstruation. She she's been purified uh, from her menstruation three times. Uh, ben Othaymin, he mentions that the sound view, uh, in according to his view, is that al quru uh, refers to height, that it refers to uh, the menstruation cycles. <coughs> and so, uh, this hadith, it illustrates for us uh, and, and clarifies for us the... Uh, the waiting period, how it is determined, al aqra and that it is thalatha, thalatha to quru, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, and as we mentioned, that the scholars differ over the meaning of al quru. In the next hadith, narrated uh, Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala an, the divorce of a slave woman occurs by saying it, meaning the divorce word or pronouncing talaq, twice. And her idda, her waiting period, is two menses. Reported by a Darqutni, he reported it as murfu'a, a saying of the Prophet, وسلم, and graded it da'if. Uh, Abu Dawood, a Tirmidhi, and Ibn Majah reported the aforesaid uh, hadith from the narration of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, which Al-Hakam graded as Sahih, but the Hadith scholars disagreed with him and they agreed that it is uh, Daif or a weak uh, Hadith. However, from this Hadith, uh, it lets us know that a male slave may consummate his divorce uh, by pronouncing it two times, okay, with the slave woman. And Whereas the duration of a female slave's idda is two uh, menses cycles, two menstruations. And so one of the benefits, although these are weak narrations, that is the scholars still derive from these, uh, these uh, narrations, is that that divorce, that it differs, uh, as, as we understand, between whether someone is uh, free or a slave. That, of course, we mentioned that the, uh, the waiting period for uh, women who are free, free women, uh, that it is thalatha uh, tuqru, that it is three uh, menstruation cycles, or as some of the scholars mentioned, that it is three... Uh, purifications and this differs from the uh, the slave girl so we learn from this hadith that 
uh, there is a difference that the hukum or the ruling uh, differs whether someone is free or whether someone is uh, a slave. And likewise, uh, so that, that, that uh, pertains to both the talaq and also to the, the waiting period itself, that the waiting period uh, for the, uh, what we learn from this hadith, uh, according to the narration of uh, Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, is that it is uh, two, uh, two uh, uh, menstruations or two menstrual cycles. So the pronouncement of talaq is two and the uh, period of menstruation is two in accordance with these narrations. In the next uh, hadith, in the 957th hadith, narrated Ruwayfi, uh, Ruwayfi uh, ibn Thabit radiallahu ta'ala an, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, it is not lawful for a man who believes in Allah and the last day to water what another person has sown. Uh, Abu Dawood in a Tirmidhi reported it, Ibn Hiban graded it as sahih or authentic, and Al-Bazar uh, graded it as Hassan. Uh, from this hadith, there are immense uh, benefits, but one of the things for clarification, uh, this hadith uh, illustrates for us uh, with regards to the meaning, is this hadith may imply two meanings. First, uh, one should not commit fornication fornication, of course. This is uh, uh, one thing which is understood from the, the from this nas, or this text, as well as uh, uh, so many texts as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran and in the authentic sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa about the punishment for zina and so forth, for adultery and fornication. Uh, the second implication uh, from this hadith is that one should not perform sexual intercourse with a female slave who is already pregnant by the ex-husband or previous master until she gives birth to a child. And that is uh, also uh, a sound meaning of this hadith. And this is because the Prophet said it is not lawful for a man who believes in Allah in the last day to water what another person has sown. Uh, meaning that, uh, you know, to uh, have sexual relations with a woman who is pregnant from someone else. And uh, this, so this is the context of this hadith. What we also benefit from this hadith is, first, that it is impermissible to... Uh, to have relations, it's impermissible to have sexual intercourse with a woman who is pregnant from someone else <clears throat> until she, uh, of course, uh, has bir uh, gives birth to the to the child. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith affirms for us the um, the day of judgment because the Prophet والسلام, said, "لا يحل لي لإمري uh, okay, so the Prophet sallallahu made it a condition. He said, he said that this is not permissible, uh, that this is not, uh, you know, it is not lawful, it's not permissible for a man who believes in Allah and the Day of Judgment. So it shows us those, it highlights those very important pillars of Iman, and the first being the first pillar, which is in tu'mina billahi, is to believe in Allah, is to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, you know, with with proper Islamic monotheism, proper Tawheed. And so this hadith affirms for us, uh, you know, it makes ithbat yom al akhirah. This hadith affirms for us that this is a part of the belief of a Muslim, that they believe in, in the Day of Judgment. And this is also uh, affirmed for us in so many, uh, in ayat and ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
and from amongst those hadith is the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salatu salam when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was asked about uh, Islam and Iman and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam when asked about Iman he said in tu'mina billahi wa malaikati wa kutubihi wa rasulihi wa yawm al-akhir wa tu'mina bi qadri khayrihi wa shar that he said it is to believe in Allah to believe in in tu'mina billahi wa malaika and his angels uh, and his his books and his messengers, I name after those salatu salam, and the day of judgment, and to believe in the the the, the divine destiny al qadr, khairi wa shar, the good and the evil of it. So those are all the pillars of iman, <clears throat> the six pillars of iman, and in this hadith, two of the pillars were mentioned, and this affirms for us that very very important pillar of iman, which is believing in yom al qiyamah, because. As we know, many of the uh, disbelievers, uh, aside from the Jews and the Christians, Ahli Kitab, that many, there are many uh, groups of disbelievers and pa people who have pagan religions and so on and so forth who do not believe in the Day of Judgment or uh, people who have no religion at all, who do not believe uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists that they don't believe even in Yom Al-Qiyamah. First and foremost, they don't believe in Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. So then it goes to show that they don't believe in a day of judgment where they'll be called to account and held to account for what they did in this life. So this hadith uh, affirms for us Yom Al-Qiyamah. Uh, also from this hadith, uh, it shows us that uh, so many nusus or so many texts in the shara uh, from the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam remind us uh, in order to help us in our ibadah and that's why there's a reminder why the prophet alayhi salatu wasallam said <clears throat> it is not lawful for a man who believes in Allah in the last day so this is for the one who believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and yawm al qiyamah meaning that they should have taqwa that they should fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they should adhere to the commandments of Allah and fear his punishment. So this uh, is just another illustration that many texts, even if it regarding uh, all kind of various subjects in the shara or various sciences, that they all uh, are about worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how to fear Allah tabarak wa ta'ala and adhere to his, uh, his commandments. Those are just some of the benefits uh, from this hadith. <clears throat> in the in the next hadith, narrated Umar radiallahu ta'ala an regarding a wife of Allah's husband, uh, she she should wait for four years and then observe the idda for four months and ten days before she may remarry Malik and a Shafi'i uh, reported this uh, this narration. So this hadith gives us the hukum of the uh, mafqood, that the, the uh, basically a husband who is lost, who is, uh, that there's no word on uh, about his, uh, his whereabouts. And what is the ruling for the woman who's caught in this situation? A woman who, that the, the ch you know, the chances are very uh, likely that her husband has been killed. This could be a situation of jihad, fisabilillah, or some other situation. So what is the ruling? This hadith illustrates for us the ruling regarding the husband uh, who is lost. And the fuqaha, the scholars of fiqh, they mention about this, and this is in the situation where there's an overwhelming uh, possibility that the husband uh, has died or was killed. So that the woman should wait, uh, according to the shara, uh, for four years uh, in this situation. To uh, that, you know, this is in the situation she doesn't have. Uh, the news about this, she doesn't know, and uh, as some of the scholars, the scholars mentioned, 
that uh, that her idda after the waiting the four years is the four months and uh, ten days, which is the idda of the one who uh, of the widower or of the widow. So uh, this hadith informs us. Uh, that a woman whose husband is reported to be lost shall have to wait four years before she can remarry. This waiting period of four years was determined by Umar radiallahu ta'ala and later the companions of the Prophet sallallahu had a consensus to this effect and the righteous scholars also pronounced their judgment based upon this ruling. In the next narration, <clears throat> the next narration, uh, if it was a sound narration, would give us uh, the details which are necessary. But as Ben Uthaymin mentions, that in this narration, uh, that which is weak in its, um, in its chain of narr uh, narration, as well as weak in, in the metan, in the actual text itself. And so there isn't, uh, this does not uh, affect the ruling uh, which the prior hadith mentioned. Uh, and this is the hadith, uh, the 959th hadith, narrated Al Mughira ibn Sha'ba radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, The spouse of a lost husband remains his wife till she gets uh, certain news about his death. A Darqutni reported it with a da'if, uh, weak chain of narrators. Uh, so, as we mentioned, this is a weak hadith, and that. This hadith also would uh, carries in its meaning what that which would be harmful, and so it goes against even in its meaning against the shar because a woman would be left waiting until she, uh, till she, you know, received news for sure about her husband. And in many cases, that may not be the case, especially in the past, especially in the past when it was much more difficult to uh, obtain information that a woman could have been waiting indefinitely. So this hadith uh, it does not uh, affirm any hukum, any ruling. And as the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, la darar wa la dirar, that there is no harm and there's no reciprocating harm because there would be great harm in that uh, situation. In the next hadith, uh, narrated Jabir, uh, narrated Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, a man must not spend the night in the house of a woman unless he is her husband or a mahram, uh, reported by a uh, Muslim. <coughs> in this hadith, reported in uh, Sahih Muslim, uh, this hadith, as well as the next few uh, hadith, they mention the importance of the mahram, of the woman, uh, and, and that... Uh, the, the, the guardian of the woman and who is permissible or uh, to be alone with a woman and that a, a woman and a man who is uh, who doesn't for, for, fit under the description of being a, a mahram is not permissible uh, to be alone uh, with a woman. So in this hadith the hadith of Jabir radiallahu ta'ala and he said a man must not spend the night in the house of a woman unless he is her husband or mahram. Uh, so this hadith, it, uh, some of the benefits from this hadith is it shows us the danger of, uh, of men and women uh, mixing and uh, without being one, uh, the man being the Mahram. And this is because that in order to close the potential for uh, zina, for uh, either uh, for adulterous or fornication to happen, this cuts the door. And this is from uh, Sadda Dhariya. And this is a nas, this is a text. Sadda Dhariya referring to a principle in. Uh, a qaida in fiqh, which is cutting off the, um, which means to basically cut off the means to 
something. It's closing the door to this sin, so to speak, making sure that, uh, you know, meaning that it's impermissible, the things that lead up, not just zina itself, but leading up, looking at the Muharram and being in a situation where you're alone. And this is what this hadith illustrates for us, the impermissibility of the khalwa and the danger of it. Another benefit of this hadith uh, uh, is that it, it, it illustrates that the khalwa of a man with a woman is muharram, that it is uh, impermissible uh, if they do not have nikah or one uh, or the man is the mahram. Uh, this also, this hadith also uh, illustrates for us <clears throat> the uh, the importance of adab and manners in the shara. That this hadith shows us that there is a certain type of manners and mannerisms uh, between male and female that must be observed and that the sharia uh, gives that great importance because of the sinfulness and the harms that result from adultery and adulterous uh, practices. Another uh, benefit of this hadith is this hadith uh, from the apparent meaning of this hadith is that that it's permissible to for a man to be uh, to stay at a woman's house who is not his mahram, who he is not the mahram for if there is a mahram present uh, that this this would be permissible that to to be in the home alone with her and even stay the evening for example maybe a man is intending to marry a woman and he's traveled a great distance and he stays in the home with the family. Uh, of course, obviously, in his own room, away from the woman, not alone with her. So, <clears throat> this hadith illustrates for us that as long as there is uh, a guarantee of uh, uh, safety uh, in that situation, meaning safety from zina and so forth, that this is uh, permissible. This is another benefit that the scholars uh, derive from this, this hadith. In the next hadith, this is a hadith of uh, Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala an, narrated Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala an, huma, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, a man must not be alone with a woman except in the presence of a mahram. Uh, Bukhari reported it. This hadith also affirms for us the, that, uh, the impermissibility of khalwa and that a man and a woman should not be left alone, as is mentioned in another hadith, that the shaitan, that they're ne never really alone, that the shaitan is the third, uh, if they are not, uh, you know, husband and wife, or that the male is not, a, uh, is a, uh, if the male is a mahram, then, then, then this is permissible. This will not be the case. And so this hadith affirms for us that same uh, hukum and same ruling uh, and also emphasizes the, um, uh, and illustrates the impermissibility of khalwa. In the next hadith, narrated Abu Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala an, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, regard to the captives taken at Autas. There must be no intercourse with a pregnant woman till she gives birth or with one who is not pregnant till she has had one menstrual period. Abu Dawood reported it and Al-Hakam graded it as Sahih authentic. The aforesaid hadith has a supporting narration from Ibn Abbas anhuma, reported by Ad-Daraqutni. So this uh, hadith uh, illustrates for us the... <clears throat> the impermissibility of mixing the uh, and sab or the 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 lineage that and uh, and this hadith also shows us the uh, importance of lineage that uh, in the situation that if a woman were pregnant 
and was taken as a war captive in this situation. As the Prophet ﷺ said, he said, do not have relations with them because she's expecting from her, her prior husband. You know, she's expecting. So she must, you know, that, that way there's no confusion about who the father is and, and so forth. Likewise, this hadith, uh, uh, as the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, and the one who is not pregnant till she has had one menstrual period. And this makes sure that, that she is pure from, uh, from having, you know, the possibility that she could have been pregnant uh, then, you know, this is uh, freeing from that, that doubtfulness that, that that wouldn't be something to have to worry about. So this shows us the importance uh, <clears throat> of respecting those uh, rulings. Also, this hadith shows us that the hamil or the one, the, the, the pregnant woman, that she does not have a height, that she does not have a... Uh, menstruation and that when she has her child uh, until she has her child then she doesn't have height and of course if she has a child then this would and, and she bleeds then this would be the nifas the postpartum uh, uh, menstruation or blood uh, also this hadith shows us that the through one height one menstruation in this situation that this um is this suffices to uh to clear a woman uh or from to to be able to determine that a woman is not uh pregnant that if she has menstruation then this uh, can, this will then make her lawful uh, in, in this situation. Those are just some of the benefits of that hadith. And then the last hadith of this um, this this uh, chapter here, narr uh, in the 963rd hadith, narrated Abu Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala'an, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the child born out of wedlock belongs to the one whose bed it is born. And stoning to death is for the fornicator. Uh, agreed upon regarding Abu Huraira's hadith. The aforesaid hadith is also a part of Aisha's hadith. Radiallahu ta'ala anhuma in the course of a story. And from Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala an by an nisai And from Uthman by Abu Dawood. So this hadith... Uh, illustrate for us uh, that a woman's child will always be attributed to her husband and shall remain in his custody. If someone claims that he had an unlawful sexual intercourse with a certain woman and that the child which is in her custody belongs to him, in this situation, the child will still belong to the woman's husband. And so long as the man in question has confessed to committing an act of fornication, Sharia ruling shall be enforced on him. No ruling, however, shall be pronounced on the woman merely on the statement of the fornicator unless four witnesses support the same. Otherwise, a ruling of uh, accusing her falsely of slander shall be pronounced uh, against him. So this shows us, uh, the this hadith illustrates for us a couple of very important things. That the child born out of wedlock belongs to the one whose bed it is born, that it belongs to the... Uh, the father so it's not based upon speculation and also that the one who uh, if a, a man were to appear as, as what we just mentioned who claims that he had fornicated with her then this would be a bearing witness against his him, himself not against the woman unless there were four witnesses as is required by the sheriff those are just some of the uh, main benefits uh, of that hadith. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Wa sallallahu wa sallam.
ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam